Ms. Johnson. Speaker. Mr Speaker, I move that the House does not tolerate sexual harassment in the workplace, acknowledges that sexual harassment is not a women's issue, it's a societal issue which every Australian and every Australian workplace can contribute to addressing, acknowledge that workplace sexual harassment is not inevitable and is not acceptable, acknowledges that sexual harassment in the workplace is preventable, acknowledges victims of sexual harassment including those, those who have spoken out and those who have been silenced, and commits to promoting a safe workplace culture where women are treated with respect. Mr Speaker, I rise today to call on members of this place to speak as one in condemning sexual harassment in the workplace and to recognise our responsibility to promote safe workplaces. I want to begin by addressing the issue of conflict of interest head on. Yes, the victim who made the complaint is my sister. And yes, I am a witness who wasn't called to give evidence in the internal labour investigation. That is a matter that is on the public record and I do not shy away from it. But today I'm also speaking as a mother because I have a daughter who will soon be entering the workforce and I worry about what may happen to her in the workplace and I want her to be safe. I'm speaking as a friend and a supporter of other women who have been subjected to sexual harassment at the hands of Mr David O'Byrne and others. I'm speaking up as a woman who wants this to stop and says enough is enough. But most importantly, I'm speaking today as a community leader, a member of this parliament who has an obligation to speak up on behalf of women and shine a spotlight on this issue. It saddens me that in 2021, that a motion of this nature is still needed. The events of the last two months, the experience of my sister and others, tells me that it is needed now more than ever. Mr Speaker, in 2007-2008, Mr O'Byrne, then 38, a union boss married with two young children, kissed and sent explicit and vulgar text messages to a junior employee on probation in her early 20s. These facts are not disputed. Mr O'Byrne has admitted them. Publicly, he gave an unreserved apology. He said that, I acknowledge that my behaviour did not meet the standards I would expect of myself, and that it had given him cause to reflect deeply on the nature of consent. Of course, the circumstances surrounding his conduct at the time, the significant power imbalance between a senior male boss and a young female probationary employee, meant that consent was not possible. It is not unreasonable to expect that an experienced boss of a union would have known this. Unions are called on all the time to represent and advocate for workers where there is a power imbalance that has been misused. However, Mr Speaker, Mr O'Byrne is a 52-year-old man who has risen from the ranks of a union movement to the top of the Labor Party, who in June 2021 would have us believe that he's only just now understood the nature of consent after deep reflection following a complaint. Does he really take us for fools? Despite his public statements, Mr O'Byrne acted in a manner that demonstrated a lack of respect for the complainant and disturbingly a lack of respect for women in the workplace. When he had the opportunity to show leadership and accept his wrongdoing, he instead chose to attack the complainant, further traumatising her. He called in lawyers, tried to background on her and changed his tune by saying that the conduct was consensual. The mishandling of this complaint by the Labor Party is mind-boggling. When the detailed complaint was confidentially made, it took Labor two weeks before it was properly acknowledged. In the meantime, someone within Labor told Mr O'Byrne of the complaint and its contents. Mr O'Byrne took it upon himself to contact potential witnesses for the complainant and to try and influence the evidence that they might give. He also talked about the complaint more widely within the party, breaching the confidentiality of the process. When it became apparent that the media had the story that a complaint had been made, Mr O'Byrne's private response was not one of remorse, but instead he threatened to sue the ABC. When Labor finally properly acknowledged the complaint by instigating an internal investigation, and note I do not call it, call an internal investigation independent, he didn't reiterate his public unreserved apology. 
Instead, he dragged the complainant through a horrendous investigation process where he vigorously defended his actions. The investigation process itself was fundamentally flawed and inappropriate when dealing with a sensitive issue like sexual harassment. On one occasion, the complainant was denied the opportunity to have a support person with her. Most concerning was the refusal of the investigator to speak with a number of the complainant's witnesses. These were people who could provide evidence that, at the time the complainant did not want the sexual advances of her boss and found them repulsive. They could provide evidence that she was frightened of losing her job and that she was repulsed by his behaviour. They could attest to the traumatising impact of Mr O'Byrne's conduct. To make it clear, these people have not been interviewed. There was contemporaneous documentary evidence too. Emails from August, September and October 2007 that detail the conduct and the impact of which the and the impact of it which the investigator refused to give any evidentiary weight to. For the State Secretary of the Labor Party, Mr Stuart Benson, to issue a statement yesterday saying that all witnesses that the complainant claimed had knowledge of the alleged conduct at the relevant time had been interviewed is absolutely and fundamentally incorrect. A disturbing attempt at trying to validate a flawed process and deflect attention away from the actual issue that what Mr O'Byrne admitted doing was wrong and should never have happened. The end result of this internal investigation is now a matter of public record, as it's been provided to the media by Mr O'Byrne, who unilaterally released it, with no regard to the further traumatising impact on the victim. The report determined on the evidence, remembering again that evidence can only be that of Mr O'Byrne and his witnesses and not that of the complainants, that there was no sexual harassment. It went one step further by dragging all women back to the 1950s and suggesting that the complainant consented to the conduct by virtue of her normal happy demeanour in the workplace and that this created a flirtatious atmosphere. In validating the outcome of the flawed investigation and accepting the findings, the Labor Party is putting all women on notice and saying that we now need to be mindful of how our ordinary behaviour and actions may be taken as giving consent. Labor is saying to every woman that a pleasant smile, a bubbly personality or nervously laughing at a boss's joke yep. is an open invitation for a senior employee to hit on you. Is it any wonder that women don't come forward when this is how they are treated when they do? Mr O'Byrne and the Labor Party would have us believe that what happened to my sister is an isolated incident that happened 14 years ago and that we should all just move on. But Mr Speaker, there are other women who have been victims of Mr O'Byrne's sexual harassment and unwanted advances. By my count, at least five other women since 2007 and as recently as December last year. With each woman, the complaint is remarkably similar. Vulgar and unsolicited text messages of a sexual nature, abhorrent sexually explicit comments directed at them, physical advances that made them feel uncomfortable and unsafe, inappropriate touching of a sexual nature. And each of these women know of others. Out of respect for these women, recognising the traumatic experience they've already been through at the hands of Mr O'Byrne and their genuine concern about their, how they would be vilified publicly and within the Labor Party, I will not name them in this place. Unlike some that they have encountered within the Labor Party, I care deeply about these women and their experiences have shocked me more than I thought it would. I want to share some of the experiences. The Tasmanian Times on the 3rd of July reported allegations made by two Green volunteers. It said, and I quote, During the 2014 state election campaign, I agreed to do some letterboxing for the Greens. I received a message one day that the flyers and maps were ready for the area I agreed to do. I went into the Greens campaign office to pick them up. It was a weeknight, about 8pm late February. When I got there, the door was locked. There were two girls inside and they both looked upset. I said to the glass I was there to pick up some flies and they let me in and locked the door again. The younger one, late teens, let's call her Imogen, not real name, was holding back tears. She was being comforted by a slightly older girl, let's call her Chloe. 
Chloe pointed the fly at the piles of flyers and went through them until I found my allocation. It was awkward in there. I asked Chloe quietly what was going on, if there was something I could help with. The following conversation took place. Chloe, you wouldn't believe David O'Byrne and Scott Bacon were just in here. Me, what? Chloe, yeah, we were just doing our stuff. Imogen was calling people about the flies. I was sorting out maps. Anyway, they were walking past down Elizabeth Street. They saw us in here. They started calling out, hey, little greenies, in the green shop and leering at us through the window. We ignored them. Then they tried the door, and it wasn't locked at that stage, and they came in. That was, we didn't expect it. Anyway, they were really drunk. They could barely walk. They were totally out of it. I burned said to Imogen, and he made it sound so sleazy, maybe you and I should work on some Labor-Green relations, hey? I said, leave her alone. You guys have to go. Seriously, you should not be in here. And then he said to me, well, you're a bit tight, aren't you? Maybe you need some Labor policy in you as well, sweetie. I said, you can't talk to us like this, that. Get out now or I'm calling someone. I'm serious. Scott Bacon had been grinning through all, but he seemed to realise it was turning bad and pretty much dragged O'Byrne out. I shut the door and locked it. As they walked off, O'Byrne said over his shoulder loudly so we could hear it. Well, Brian said, screw the greens, at least I tried. Me? Far out. What the hell? Chloe, yeah, totally unexpected. They were so off their faces and so creepy. And after they'd, they'd gone, we were shaking, you know, really wound up. It was only just before you got here, a few minutes ago. She assured me that they were going to be okay and were about to call it a night to go home anyway. And if they could, avoid doing evenings in the campaign office anymore. I don't remember speaking specifically about the issue again. I was at the election night event at the Yacht Club in Sandy Bay. Both the girls were there. I talked a bit around the issue with Chloe. From memory, she said something like, there was so much work to do, everything was a bit of a blur, so you didn't want to dwell on anything that would get you bogged down. I really didn't hear anything directly from Imogen on either the night it happened or afterwards. On the night in question, I had no reason to doubt anything Chloe had told me. I still don't. The atmosphere story. in the office that night was, so, was just so charged with their emotion, I remember it clearly. It stayed with me. Mr Speaker, I have had members of the Parliamentary Labor Party confirm that this did take place. Other victims have reported to me that they too have tried to speak up or call out Mr O'Byrne's behaviour, but have been discouraged and told that that's just what David's like. He's handsy. It is shocking that groping and inappropriate touching can be dismissed as handsy. I know that in some circles, women actively try to buddy up so they are not at risk of being left alone with him. One victim has asked me to read the following statement on her behalf. I am a long-term Labor woman who has experienced first-hand sexual harassment by David O'Byrne in 2020. Through recent media coverage of similar behaviour by David O'Byrne, it's become to, clear to me that it is pointless and unsafe to report sexual harassment to the Labor Party. I have watched from afar as David has tried to frame the conversation as being historical and that he did this when he was younger. But it wasn't only once and it wasn't only in the past. I have spoken to multiple women who have over the years have had an instance of harassment by him. This is a pattern of behaviour where he's concerned and he's leaving a trail of victims that now feel they've had their voice taken away. Whatever the intent of the process, the consequence of the past couple of weeks is that we don't feel safe to report. We remain silent because we've seen the cost of coming forward. It's been incredibly isolating hurtful and disappointing that senior Labor and union representatives have been silent about women's rights and safety in the workplace, which is the core of this issue. Women have a right to be safe in the workplace and they have a right not to be sexually harassed in the workplace. Mr Speaker, those are extremely powerful words. It's been extremely disappointing that some within the Labor and union movement have taken to social media to defend Mr Oban by trying to paint the allegations as nothing more than factional warfare. The truth is, no matter how inconvenient it may be for them, that these victims come from across the factional divide and outside of the party. Clear there's a pattern of sexually predatory behaviour by Mr Oban towards young women and particularly where there is a power imbalance. 
Worse still, that pattern of behaviour is known by people who can do something to stop it and who should do something to stop it. And you know who you are. Whilst I acknowledge that Ms White has called for Mr O'Byrne's resignation and he's voluntarily removed himself from the Labor caucus, he remains in this place and he remains a Labor Party member. If Ms White doesn't think he is fit to sit in her caucus, then surely she should also demand that he's expelled from the party that she leads. I call on her to take a principled stand, to take back the moral high ground that Labor once held on women's issues and make it clearly known that as leader of the party, she does not tolerate this behaviour. That would speak volumes to the victims and send a clear message to all members of the Labor Party that the party does stand with women. My question to everyone in this House is how many other women have to come forward or be victims before we act. One should be enough, but I have told you that there are more. Some of you know who these victims are. Do you need a dozen, 20, 50 women before you step up and show leadership? At the end of the day, this is a workplace and we all have a duty to ensure it is safe workplace each and every one of us, whether you're the Premier, a Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Greens, or just a member, you have a responsibility to ensure that the people in this workplace are safe. And you have a responsibility to set the culture of this place, one that respects women. What we say and do matters. When a member of this parliament admits to kissing and sending sexually explicit text messages to a junior employee under his supervision, and we accept a finding that it was consensual because of an alleged flirtatious atmosphere, or we say nothing at all, we become part of the problem. Our silence or our acceptance of the behaviour sends a signal to those in the workplace and to the broader community that the threshold for establishing consent is dangerously low. And that is why this motion is so desperately needed, Mr Speaker. We must speak out as leaders. As the Attorney General highlighted earlier, the recently released Respect at Work Sexual Harassment National Inquiry Report 2020 highlighted that a recent survey conducted by the Australian Human Rights Commission found that in 2018, sexual harassment in Australian workplaces is widespread and pervasive, and that one in three people have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace in the last five years. Let me set the record straight and be very clear to every woman. Your smile does not give consent. Your happy demeanour does not give consent. Mm. Laughing at jokes does not give consent. What you wear does not give consent. Yeah. Having a drink with someone does not give consent. Being in a social situation does not give consent. You should not have to tolerate unwanted sexual advances in the workplace because they come from your boss or someone else in your workplace. You should expect to be supported when you say no or enough is enough and call it out. You deserve to be treated with respect. You have the right to expect that your complaint will be taken seriously and appropriately dealt with. And most importantly, you have the right to be safe in your workplace. Surely we can all put party politics aside and for the benefit of all Tasmanians, I agree on these very basic principles. But Mr Speaker, words alone are not enough. We must act and lead by example. We must be the model for how to handle complaints, be the model of what a safe workplace looks like and set the standard of behaviour that every Tasmanian should aspire to. I acknowledge that this debate is difficult and uncomfortable. I acknowledge that there are many good people on all sides of politics, including Labor, who feel a great sense of injustice by what has occurred and who are deeply troubled by the public discourse and the victim blaming. To those people, I say, be brave, speak up. At the March for Justice rally earlier this year, a friend held a sign that said, who are you? Victim, offender, defender, bystander. Over the last few months, I've been asking myself this very question. And I've decided that my role, I need to be a defender. Mr Speaker, I asked my colleagues, who will you be? In speaking with my sister last night, she personally welcomed the fact that Miss White has finally called publicly for Mr O'Byrne's resignation. 
But this issue is no longer just about what happened to her in 2007, 2008. It's about the experiences of other women and the nature of sexual harassment in the workplace. And clearly much more needs to be done. Mr Speaker, as I said in my maiden speech quoting Mari Black, in politics there are weathercocks and signposts. Too often we see weathercocks who spin in whichever direction public opinion or indeed internal party politics blows them, no matter what principle they have to compromise. But we each have an opportunity here to be a signpost, to stand true and tall and principled. I urge you all to say sexual harassment in the workplace ends with me. You can begin that principled journey by supporting this motion. But it's your actions in giving effect to the motion that will speak volumes. Do something. Take action. Finally, in closing, Mr Speaker, I know that this debate will have sparked significant community interest. And I am aware that there are victims of sexual harassment listening today. To you, I say, I see you and I hear you. I know that this public conversation is traumatising and difficult. If you need help and support, then please contact the Sexual Assault Support Service on 1800 697 877, Lifeline 13 11 14, Beyond Blue 1300 224 636 or 1800 Respect on 1800 737 732. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah.